I listened to a lesson and it provoked a, a thought that was said, have you disgraced your profession? The speaker was speaking to members of the Lord's church, Christians. Have you disgraced your profession? How could we disgrace it, though? A three-letter word can disgrace anything. It's called sin. It's a transgression of the law of God. That very vow, that very oath a Christian had taken to not sin no more to the best of their ability. To live a life that was for God. When we step out of that life, we disgrace the profession as a Christian. I want us to look at a few things this morning. The vow of sin. I got these verses up here for you note takers. The vow of sin or the world can disgrace and keep you from God. Not talking about the trees, not talking about the water, we're not talking about the mountains. We're talking about the activities that go on inside this world. Man's activities can be sinful and keep you from God. If we look at Romans 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed on upon all men, for that we have sinned. This is not talking about a misconception or a false teaching of born in sin. Ezekiel 18.20 in the Old Testament clearly tells us that the soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, and neither shall the iniquity of the son be born vice versa. To the father and son, you can't give that over into birth. For the righteousness shall be upon the righteousness, and the wickedness shall be upon the wicked. But this case, sin entered into the world. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But why not? We had this discussion this morning. God created this beautiful world for us to enjoy. He did. It's a temporary dwelling place for us to make sure where we are headed for a permanent dwelling place. But why do you think that um, it's wrote here, love not the world, neither the things are, that are in the world. Because in John chapter 8, and verse 23, Christ is not of the world. John 8, 23, Christ is not of the world. The practices that we see this day in this world are not of Christ. We can see that. How do we see that? Oh, we have to use that J word, don't we? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1 and 2. Judge not, lest you be judged. But if you go on to verse 2, it talks about for with what judgment you use, use righteous judgment. How are you supposed to know that you're living in a life of sin if you never open this up? Don't judge me. I'm not. You've judged yourself by your outward appearance and your actions. I read about it here. Sin is this. You're doing that? Well, God says it's sin, so you are sinning. But we don't like to hear that as people, do we? I don't. You're wrong. <sighs> it makes my skin cringe. That's to soak it in, though. If we have a humble mind and a humble heart, we're going to take what God says. Make ourselves better. Don't you want to be better? Don't you want a home with God in heaven? Yeah, but not right now. Isn't that the concept we got? That could destroy your profession as a Christian. Continuing on now in John chapter 2 and verse well, we'll start over. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man 
love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world, here we go, not the trees, not the waters, not the bees, but the sin, and he lists them right out right here. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those three things is what got Eve. Back in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, I believe. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's the point we're missing. We see this physical we talked about this morning. Anybody ever have something new? What happens a couple years from then? Oh, new shiny something new. I got to have that one. Or mine broke. What happened to that new cool thing that you have in your pocket that I'm going to keep it forever? And it breaks. It's worldly things. It's physical things. They're going to break. They're going to fail. But he that doeth the will of God, this right here in this book, abideth forever. God has given all mankind an eternal promise, but we have to work for that. We have to do a lot of things to change in our life, to renounce the vow of sin. In James chapter 1, verse 27, James says, Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To keep himself unspotted from the world is a work. Not a work you're building a ladder to heaven, but a work of faithfulness to God is a fulfillment of the commandment he give you. Sin is always going to be in the world, but God provides a way out. In Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 3. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed. You know, if you ever earnest heed, that's kind of weird language now, isn't it? Well, if you look that word uh, structure up and earnest heed means to take heed, regard, apply oneself, or attend. We have to apply ourselves. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed or apply ourselves as the Hebrew writers here is talking, to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. If you're not going to do, practice what you preach, it's going to slip from you. Verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, oh, what's recompense? It's a payment. Payment for what you've done, good or bad. Payment of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect? That word neglect means careless, make light, or have no regard at all. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us and by them that heard? An apostle's writing this. Given the account, it came down from Christ to them, to those that heard. Just like today, we're to go and to preach the gospel. You are hearing the same words. Let me take that back. You're not always hearing the same words that was spoken by the apostles. There's many false teachings, false denominations, doctrines out there that is not teaching the whole counsel of God. We have to be aware of that. We have to make that judgment, that righteous judgment, that God is going to make a way. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Romans 1, 16 and 17, the powers in the gospel. You may not realize that you're taking a vow of sin by simply not acting on what you are hearing. What's the old saying? Ignorance is bliss, right? 
Why is it bliss? I didn't know. You know how far that got Billy in school? I didn't know. That don't matter. Here's a big fat whopping zero for you. Oh, uh, teacher conferences come. It was always their fault. They never told me. I got a whole lot different in lightning after my mother and father would come out of a uh, conference with my teachers or sometimes the principal because he liked me too. I want you to think about that. You may not realize that you are taking a vow of sin by simply not acting on what you're hearing. When you hear the word of God and you choose not to obey it, you're going away from God. Now let's see how one can dishonor a vow to God. A lot of Tom, when he said something about the, the along the lines of the nose growing or something this morning, made me pop into this picture that I got here. The vow to keep from people from sinning is a warning, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 7, 1 through 4, this is going to set up the groundwork. A lot of times people don't have the groundwork. They just hear the, the gospel, but they don't know what's going on before to help. So we're going to set a little groundwork here. In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 1 through 4, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into a land, whether thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gerizites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Havites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall... Thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy sons, for they will turn away thy son from following me. That's your warning. God's telling them why. But boy, they're pretty. You better start looking with your spiritual eyes instead of your physical eyes, because things are not always as they have seen. Why will they turn their sons from following me? That they may serve other gods, little g. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. You want God's anger kindled at you? I don't. I do enough things on my own and have to beg God to forgive me. I want to willfully keep doing things to have God's anger kindled at me. But today we have the same warning about sinful people in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 and 15. Be ye not equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Baal? Or what part hath he that believeth with the infidel. Now these are the rules that set. Let's see the example of Samson. In Judges chapter 14, 1 through 3, we're just going to skip through some things here. 14, 15, and 16, if you want to go through Samson's little uh, life period of this time here. Remember what was just said, though, about marrying their sons and their daughters. They were supposed to do it, right, whenever they had the opportunity. No. Stay away from it. Now, okay, let's go on now in Judges 14, 1. And Samson went down to Tamath and saw a woman in Tamath of the daughters of the Philistines. You remember the Philistines? They were, they were uh, a good ally for God, weren't they? No. They were the enemy of God. They had false gods. They taught things that were contrary to what God had laid out. But he saw a woman of the daughters of the Philistines, and he came up and told his father and mother and said, I have seen a woman in Tamath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get me her 
for me to wife. Can you imagine what his parents saying? What? What are you doing? Why are you looking that way? You're not supposed to be doing this. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there neither a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistine? You ever had somebody say, Hey, dummy, make a different choice? Sometimes people need to tell us that, don't they? Hey, reel it back in. You need to make a different choice. Shut your eyes maybe next time and listen. Use your heart, your soul. Look for things spiritually. When we go into God's word, it's not all going to be love and hugs and things like that because it's a spiritual battle between sin and righteousness. But David said, hey, wait a minute. And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. She probably wasn't ugly. But on the inside, she was wrong for him. I want you to think about the word Delilah, because when you get to Samson, his name means sunlight. Sunlight, right. But Delilah means to bring low, dried up, to be emptied, to fail. So opposite of light is night or darkness, isn't it? She was totally opposite. God tried to warn him. This is why. He was looking on the outward and lost his true vision. Be careful what pleaseth thee. The pleaseth thee can take you away from him. James chapter 1, 14 and 15, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away out of his own lust and enticed. We lose that focus, don't we? Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Proverbs 13 and verse 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Samson, buddy, open your eyes. Son, don't do this. The opposite vow. I used on and off. Hopefully that's not going to be anything the way the world is going with. So I chose to use on and off. Green and red. The mind is where it all starts. In 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hath ye between two options? Opinions. Or sorry, opinions. How long hath ye between two opinions? We got two things to choose from, don't we? In life, we have to either serve God or serve mammon, the devil, the things of the the sins of this world. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You think it's the first time you ever said anything to anybody about the Bible and they just look at you and not say nothing? It's happened before. What are you going to say? What are we going to say? But as people, are we self-willed? Do we have a good strive or a drive? You know what God asks, but you are too self-willed to obey Him? People can be out of order too. Christians can be out of order. When they start going off and teaching things that's not found in the Word of God, they are out of order. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. 
James echoes the same thought in James 1.8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Jump to chapter 3 and verse 11 in the same book. James gives another illustration. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet and bitter water? You go to order an unsweet tea mixed with lemonade, 50-50. You take a big swig out of it and it's solid sweet tea. It didn't come out of the same tap, I can tell you that. Two different things. Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3. This is opposite of the world. Paul's writing to the church at Colossae, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affliction on things above and not things of this earth, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's an opposite vow of how the world would have it. Setting your mind up there on heaven when you've got all these physical things right now. What about suppression of the vow? Suppression means you're stopping your participation. Suppression. So I left a little question here. Blank is keeping me from obeying. This goes for Christians as well as People who've never obeyed the gospel. What is that that you can put in that blank? Some verses to consider before we get into another chapter of Judges would be Ecclesiastes 12, 13. It was said before, it goes for us this day. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first. There's a work there that we have to do. God commands us to do something towards salvation. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. He talked to his people in the Old Testament just like he talks to us today through his word. I want you, I got a bracket there for 2 Thessalonians 2.14. We are called by the gospel. And will hold thine hand and will keep thee and will give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Isn't our word today, or Christ's word that we read today, the light? Christ said, I am the light of the world. Nobody comes unto God but through Jesus Christ. Contacting that salvational blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. Light gives in to night. Judges 16, 16, and 17. Light gives in to night. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. We're talking about Samson and Delilah. And urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. You ever have somebody nag you so much? Well, keep this in your mind. That he told her all his heart and said unto her, that hath not, there hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. He had that Nazarite vow, which is taken from Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Verse 5 is actually where they are commanded that no razor is to come upon their head. There's other rules there in chapter 6. So he broke in. He gave in, didn't he? Loved her. I'm sure she had pure intentions though, right? In verses 23 and 24 now in Judges 16, darkness suppresseth the light. And the lords of the Philistines gathered them together. For to offer a great sacrifice unto the dragon, their God. 
and to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. No. Your little dragon didn't do it. Samson, by disobedience to God, way back from the beginning, is what handed him over. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Who did they give praise to? Little God, a false God. But light, light can put darkness away if we have that repentive mind. In Judges 16, 28 through 30, <clears throat> 28 through 30, Samson realized he did it wrong. Oh boy, now it comes the hard part, doesn't it? Owning up to what you've done wrong. Very hard words to swallow. In verse 28, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once. Have you ever asked God just once, please? Have you done that down that low? There's nowhere else to go but up. He had his vision restored to what he needed to do, and that was put his faith and focus back on God. That I may be at once avenged of the Philistine for my two eyes. Remember, they took his eyes out of him too and made a, a sight of him. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which the house stood, which it were, were borne up, and the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein, so that the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. But he had a sacrifice, didn't he? He had to crucify that sin. He had to own up to what he had done wrong. Kind of like Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth should not serve sin. That's the power of baptism. Don't ever let anybody tell you that baptism is not essential for salvation because that is a false teaching. The Bible outlines it clearly over and over in the New Testament. Baptism washes away your sins. It's what adds you to the Lord's church. God adds you to the church through that obedience. God's vow has conditions, though. Under the New Testament, we have to take a vow if we want to follow or obey Christ. God's conditions help us to see the corruption in our lives, and therefore he offers a way of completion for our souls for eternity. God's conditions, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Remember Christ said that? What about the letters to the seven churches, Asia Minor, Revelation 2 and verse 10? Be thou faithful unto death, and thou shalt receive a crown of righteousness. That's my conditions. Be faithful. But God helps us to see that corruption. Do you realize that your sin is separating you from God? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins has hid his face from you that he will not hear. God does not hear sin, but he's got his arms wide open. Are you yielding yourself to sin? Romans 6, 
16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, which is the separation of God, or of obedience unto righteousness. But thanks be to God, all sin shall be forgiven in Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But he, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. But everything was supposed to be forgiven. Yes, yeah, sin. But when you speak evil of God's word and you regard it as nothing for salvation, there is no hope for you. When you give this up, this is all we've got. You say, this is worth nothing. Give me something else. There is nothing else. God left us a manual. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God? In John chapter 8, verse 24, Christ said, Therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Today, are you willing to repent from sinning and be immersed for the remission of your sins? Same goes as the early church when it first started, by the authority of Jesus Christ given to the apostles to start his church. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God's vows are completed. He's offered it to all mankind. Are you willing to obey from the heart today? Paul wrote to the church in uh, Romans chapter 6, 17 and 18, But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. You once were, but now you're not a sinner. Next chapter 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and in the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They that gladly receive the word. Today, are you glad to receive the word of God? Are you willing to change your life? After you've done this, you've, you've heard the word, you're ready to change, you're, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you're willing to repent and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that with my whole heart. I'll tell anybody that. But are you willing to have your sins washed away? Today. What is holding you back in that blank from obeying God? I want you to think of this. If, if you're a child of God, after we've obeyed the gospel, but if we walk in the light and see us in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. For if we say we have no sin, we deceived ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Friend, do you have sin in your life today? Will you let us help you get rid of that sin this day? If you have a need to respond to the invitation, we ask that you do so as together we come and stand and sing.